So I'm going to talk about calcification, so basically growth of corals, how do corals grow and what are the factors that um, influence this very basic uh, characteristic. I should, I should have mentioned it's not, I've had a whole list of names there <laughs> and it's been a great team that's helped me do this work. So the problem we face now um, um, is, is CO2. Uh, emissions are going up and it looks like um, even worrying about things like 1.5 degree warming is irrelevant. We're going to soon cross to two degrees. And um, you'll hear a lot about the effect of warming um, and how that's to affect coral bleaching. Of course, there's another effect of CO2 and that's on in, in ocean acidification. And these two factors together have been called the you know, twin perils of, of corals. So why, uh, the thing I'm going to address uh, this morning is why are corals so vulnerable to thermal stress? particularly the calcification process, um, and how does ocean acidification and global warming affect corals? Now, ocean acidification is, um, is, a, is a very simple process. It's the uh, uptake of CO2 by into seawater. And this just shows you what we're doing um, over long time scales. So this is um, going back 10,000 years. So most of the recent history of reefs have been experienced this level of CO2 through 330 ppm, and now we're shooting it um, essentially off scale. So this graph was made in 2005. I like to show it still, because that was where, the, in, the, in the, that period, we've now moved off the scale above 400 ppm. Now, um, in thinking about the very simple um, effect of dissolving CO2 into seawater, it's a very simple chemical reaction we, you know, that's well known. And basically, um, we're shifting the uh, carbonate, how, how carbonate ions are distributed in seawater. We have carbonate ions shown here in red. This is the critical component for calcification. And as we dissolve CO2, we're shifting the seawater uh, to the left, making it, uh, lowering the pH. And this is the so-called acidification effect or ocean acidification. And actually, the bicarbonate is increasing. So the total um, carbonate budget or the DIC is increasing slightly, but the critical thing is this decrease in, in carbonate iron. Um, now, for a long period, um, particularly because it's part of this basic reaction of making calcium carbonate, um, the, 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 and this is expressed in terms of a saturation state, which is you can write the, this equation as a product of calcium and carbonate iron with a constant. And when we have omega equals one, that meant ca calcium carbonate was stable, less than one was um, it would dissolve. And, and most reefs were growing in areas in pre-industrial where they were in oversaturated waters up, up to four. And you can see the predictions of declining um, saturation state of the oceans as we continue to increase atmospheric CO2 and as the oceans continue to, to, to take it up. So you see the saturation state declining um, it's still not less than one globally, but it's, it's almost halved in, in our predictions. And that, those, those are, are, I would say, now are inevitable facts that are going to happen. And we're already um, way down into this part of the area here compared to the pre-industrial. Now, if you're thinking about what happens with corals, the question then is how do they calcify? How do they use the seawater component? And if you take the view that they're directly dependent on, on the... On the um, on seawater to calcify, then of course w this would be a dramatic effect because that would be halving uh, the concentration of calcium carbonate. But we know that corals actually have ways, um, so this is meant to meant this area here, this is the actual skeleton, and there's a lot of biology in between. This is the calcifying fluid, and corals have attributes such as uh, pumps where they're able to pump calcium in and they extract hydrogen ions out so they can modulate the pH. So they're able to do some buffering. But nevertheless, if you thought, if, if the, and the early models were sort of assuming that they were directly connected to the seawater, that would be, uh, the ocean acidification effect would therefore be very, very profound. But we know, however, that um, there's other sources of particular carbonate ions. And I use the word DIC, which is defined as the carbonate, bicarbonate, and, the to and CO2, so essentially the total dissolved carbon budget. So we know there's a metabolic pathway, which I won't try and describe in detail, but um, it's related to how the zooxanthellae function, how CO2 is provided to the zooxanthellae, and how um, 
In other words, the metabolic sources of DIC are produced. And so we have these two processes. We have a metabolic source and we have a seawater um, pathway. And understanding the balance between those is therefore critical in understanding how they will respond to ocean acidification. And what I will now show you is this also explains why they're so sensitive to temperature and to bleaching. Okay, these are the tools we have. We've, at UWA, we've actually been able to find all the parameters to do with carb the, that calcifying fluid. So we know the pH, we've got methods to do this. And this is showing you how we do it using boron isotopes. So it will take a whole day to explain it, but it's pretty simple actually. We can get the carbonate ion, we can get the total DIC, we can get the saturation state and some new developments. Now gives us, um, this is Raman spectroscopy that one of our postdocs has developed. A Tom DiCarlo, we can get the calcium concentration as well. So we can define all the critical parameters in this calcifying fluid, and therefore we can address, and this is some of the facilities we have, I should say ARC funded as well. <laughs> um, so we now have the ability to, to, to characterise this calcifying fluid, and of course look at its response under different conditions. And this just shows the response, this is actually done, this is data from, this shows seawater pH, and this shows the pH of that calcifying fluid environment. So you notice the first thing is that the, um, well, the, these, these are data, I should say, done at constant temperature. I'll come to that point in a minute. There's lots of quite nice relationships. But the first thing we notice is that corals, which I've already said, they elevate their pH um, compared to seawater. So there's this elevation, that, that's that calcium ATPase pumps I mentioned. Um, and they're about 0.2 to 0.5 pH units higher than seawater in general. Most corals operate that way. And there's a different slope. You notice that the slope of the array as a changing pH is different to, um, to, to, to the actual linear uh, slope. This is different, different types of calcifiers. Um, but there's one caveat, I have to say. These are static aquaria experiments, right? So how does this really... what? And does this really capture the full process? I thought it did when we published this paper. I was very confident we could now predict all these outcomes. And I was confident that, that you only see one third to one half the effect. Um, but you always learn, you have to go remember, you have to work in the real world with coral reefs. And so what I'm going to show now is, is data we've gathered over the last few years, uh, looking at um, corals from Coral Bay. I should say also we've done work on on, this, on, on corals from the Great Barrier Reef, but also Rottnest Island offshore Perth. Um, and what we've done, we've, cal we've calibrated, we understood the water conditions in detail, the temperatures, the pH and so on. Um, and we've used these species of parietes, but in, in, in Rottnest Island, there's uh, Acropora and um, uh, Possilopora and some other species. This is work done by a student just finishing. And so, this, so we've gone out now and looked at what's going on in the real world using these tools. Now, if you just look at seawater pH by itself, um, this shows the temperature on, on the right axis. The red is the natural temperature variability over about seven or eight years. And this is the seawater pH oscillating. I'll show you now data from that Parietes coral. So this is what we predicted from the Aquaria experiments is how that the pH of the calcifying fluid should be. As I mentioned, it's, it's elevated compared to seawater and it should oscillate with roughly one third the um, amplitude as seawater. That was our prediction. When we did the measurements, this is what we found. In much larger um, oscillations, um, still correlated in, in phase, but, but very different response. When we look, just another way to show the same thing is this is the seawater pH. This is what the seawater was doing. I actually now also show data from this Ningaloo Reef and Davies Reef in the GBR. This is what we predicted. And this is what we actually observed. Now this, this difference is very significant. It's about um, 0.2, 0.3 pH units, which is like the change at 2100 compared to today in seawater pH. So the, the, you know, the, um, the, the, and this, this is as a function of temperature. You can see the temperature range is about 20 degrees to nearly over 30. So there's a very strong metabolic control, obviously, happening over seasonal timescales on how corals manipulate um, their pH. 
and we can convert it to our DIC, um, which is the total, this is the total DIC compared to seawater. You can see that corals elevate their, um, their DIC relative as the pH oscillates. And actually, this is what happens in summer. So it, the highest DIC is in summer, so that's the metabolic effect that I talked about. And in winter, they actually have much lower, oh, sorry, in winter, they have uh, the highest pH and the sum of the lowest pH. So this is oscillation in pH, which is seasonally controlled. And it's like an accelerator that the corals are manipulating their pH to control the DIC. And sorry to get, keep using all these terms. And the reason they're doing that is this magical parameter of the saturation state, the internal saturation state. And this, remember, is what controls their growth, right? The growth rate, basically, the first order depends on this saturation state. So different there's a very narrow range of which corals operate in terms of saturation state. So first point, they, there's a threshold. If they don't get to that state, they won't calcify. So that's a minimum condition to calcify. And regardless of the temperature range, they like to even out their growth rate or their saturation state, which makes perfect sense. You don't want to, if you're thinking of existing, you would like to grow at a reasonably constant rate and not have huge seasonal fluctuations. So it's, a good, it's just what you could say is an adaptation that, um, that, that makes a lot of common sense. And, and there's very little range, and these are subtle differences between individual colonies here. Let's look at some different species. This is Rottenest Island. And in this case, um, the student, these, the, she sampled this reef throughout about 18 months. Every point is a sampling data expedition. Where regardless of whether it's summer, in summertime, it's fine to do it. In wintertime, we have some nice storms, but she persisted. Um, and this shows the record, the seasonal record of the DIC and the PHCF. This is all in the calcifying fluid. I won't dwell on that, but in some of the same pattern though, the higher DIC in the summer, that's the metabolic effect, that makes perfect sense. And then the winter lower, or the winter has the higher pH to compensate. So if you look at, this is the same data showing the same way. So this is the, actually these are the colonies at Rottenest Island. So I know some people have been there on their tourist trips. Now they are sort of flourishing in some ways because the water is warming. But anyway, there's this relationship of the PHCF versus the DIC. You can see that different species have slightly different offsets, but this seems to be a very common uh, phenomenon. There's the summer, higher DIC, and the same pattern I showed you before. And interestingly now, this is the same pattern for the saturation state. The two, the two different species, but they're maintaining almost constant saturation state. This shows, by the way, the seawater um, um, saturation state, so they're elevating it by about a factor of four, but keeping it very constant in order to maintain this constant growth. And I should say these, these cropper are growing moderately slow, but we've been taking tips of them every monthly sampling period to get this data. Um, how so I've gone through different species, um, and this is kind of a summary of, of the same plot of the, this internal pH versus the um, DIC. And this actually shows deep sea corals which don't have any zooxanthellae. And they tend to operate around about the same seawater. This ratio is closer to one, suggesting that type of coral tends to be dominated. Its DIC source is mostly coming directly from seawater, not by the metabolic sources, because they don't, they don't live in the surface. They live in deep waters where there's no light and no zooxanthellae. Um, and they um, haven't evolved that capability, whereas the other species, some of which are shown here, show this effect. And these are, this is like a global summary. I could point to some of the different areas, but um, this is different species and so on and so on. So this looks like a universal rule, if you like, for coral calcification and growth. But now let's get back to the point about calcification. So what I've said is that the DIC, this pathway here, is about a factor of two to three times more important than the seawater pathway um, under seasonal forcing. And we've missed this, if you, if you just did regular aquaria experiments and you didn't have this metabolic um, forcing properly controlled, which is very difficult in aquaria experiments, you would miss this pathway. Now the significance for t bleaching though is that when we have bleaching, this pathway gets 
removed or, or knocked out because the first off you lose the zoos and thalle and the uh, this interaction of the producing the metabolic co2 is essentially what the thermal bleaching or the temperature stress uh, kills off right so corals therefore cannot get to this critical threshold of saturation state to calcify. So unless they can do that, they won't calcify. So that now explains why they're so sensitive to, to temperature. If you remove this pathway, they can't get to that magical saturation state. They therefore cannot calcify. Um, they still may have a small bit of energy left to, to use the seawater pathway, but again, it's not sufficient to get over that, that critical um, a saturation state to continue to exist and grow. So that's why, um, the, you know, this, this therefore kind of uh, provides, if you like, a kind of mechanistic reason as to why um, bleaching, the temperature part of the, the CO2 cycle is, is so catastrophic for corals. And it turns out the, the ocean acidification is not at the moment um, a critical limitation. It's losing this, this side of the um, equation. And so I'll just um, wrap it up at that point. So corals tightly upregulate the saturation state. And remember, that's a very simple parameter. It's the calcium times the carbonate. Um, they elevate it by factors of, it's about, this is, seawater's about three to four, by about a factor of four. And they could control their threshold limited rate, rate of growth. Um, so this symbiosis is critical, uh, as a critical pathway to, uh, as the source of metabolic CO2. Um, and um, if, if this supply is highly vulnerable to thermal stress, and so the global warming, and particularly these marine heat waves, which they're not adapted to, um, is, is now, that's why it is now causing this widespread mortality, because they simply cannot calcify under such conditions. So thanks very much. <laughs>